Hello, my fellow Potterheads. So the newest Fantastic Beasts film has just come out, The Crimes of Grindelwald, and, well, you might be wondering what my thoughts were on the film. Well, there's a lot of thoughts, so uh, let's just jump into it. Or apparate into it, maybe. I don't also, know. I'd like to preface this by saying that I am a big Harry Potter fan. Always have been. I went to the midnight releases of every single book at Barnes & Noble. I went to the midnight releases of the films, the original eight, the only eight. And I've read each of the books about three times. I'm on my fourth time at the moment for the third book, except this time in German. Krumbein is up to no good. Or as they say in German, crooked leg. Crookshanks, Krumbein, right? Little, little Seidenschnabel, little Schnäbelchen. Little buck beak. Yeah, anyway, it, it's good. I'm loving it in German, but uh, th that's beside the point. Basically, not a hater, okay? I like Harry Potter, which is why this is so hard to do. Now, there are a lot of glaring problems with the new Fantastic Beast, the cash grab of Grindelwald movie, and it's really hard to pick what is the most important flaw of the film because there are so many and they hold equal footing. But if I had to choose one, it would have to be the editing. The editing for this film is bizarre. It's jarring. It's confusing. I do not know why it was edited in such a way. There are a lot of shots in the beginning that have such close-up zooms on the face. You're like, oh, uh, hello there. Back it up, please. Like, I felt a little bit uncomfortable. Who decided to put those in the film? And then also, in order to tell a story, it's just flashback to flashback to exposition to exposition. That is not how you make a good film. It's boring. It's boring storytelling. There was so many different flashback cutscenes to cutscenes to getting back that I'd forget who was on screen. It would be this forgettable character or this forgettable character. I didn't know what the difference was between them. I'm like, is this Lita or is that the Tina girl or is, is, is that still? I, I don't understand. There is too many forgettable characters going on for the editing to be so bizarre and discontinuous. It is surprising that for me the editing was the number one thing, but second only to that, the writing is just so bad. The plot makes absolutely no sense. There are like eight different subplots for these forgettable characters going on. None of them really make sense in their own right or converge in a way that makes sense. The editing makes the story even worse so they work hand in hand in making this bad. I don't know why anyone allowed Rowling to screenwrite this thing. She's not a screenwriter. She's really good, okay, at making universes and writing novels. She's not a screenwriter. You can really tell by this. It's so incoherent. Why Why did they let her do this? It, it's just sad. It's sad because it didn't have to be this way. The thing is, if this was a brand new original story, it could have been a bit better. But the fact that they constantly are double dipping back into the old canon, into the Harry Potter universe to try and bring in nostalgia and bring in like, remember this kids, is what makes it so bad. Because when you do that, you have to make sure you get the details right. The easy details, by the way. I'm not asking for like exact details on the shape of someone's wand to be the same. I'm talking about basic stuff. One of my favorite scenes from the entire Crimes of Grindelwald film are when they went back to Hogwarts. Here comes the music, everyone. Nostalgia. This is why you paid money to see this film, right? It's to bring back those Harry Potter memories from an actual good film. And then we find out that McGonagall is so badass, she is teaching at Hogwarts before she was born! What the f- Like, I just- Who decided that? JK did. Alright, let's not make any excuses for anyone else. JK Rowling willingly put McGonagall in a film to give that little fan service people going, Oh, I love McGonagall and the old films are so great. She's not born yet! What- what is this? And a lot of people, these uh, rolling apologists are saying things in the comments like, Oh, well, you don't know. Maybe it's her mom. Wrong! Alright, let's not happen and check the credits. Minerva McGonagall. That is who she is credited as. Minerva, Minerva McGonagall in 1929 teaching Hogwarts. Despite the fact that in book 5 and film 5, she specifically said to Umbridge she had been teaching for 39 years at the school, which would put it in the 50s when she started, which is well after when Grindelwald was stopped by Dumbledore, but this film takes 30 place in the- It doesn't make sense! That's such a glaring, stupid error that was clearly just done for fan service, regardless. Like, Rowling knew what she was doing there, and she still messed it up, just because she's like, whatever, who cares? No one's gonna care. This is my universe now. I can just change everything retroactively. You might be thinking as well, Dumbledore, what did he teach in school? I don't know, if you've read all the books, maybe you don't even have to. You know he taught Transfiguration, right? It's not that big a deal, but kind of is to his, you know, character in the books and the films. Nah, we'll just rewrite that. We, he now teaches Defense Against the Dark Arts, because that way we can put a bogger in the film for some screenwriting. Why? Just use a different teacher. Have him, if you really want hot Jude Law in the film, cool, great. You know, show him in the class with the actual Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Why? <sighs> I'd say this film is definitely more beast than fantastic. You can always tell when a film is poorly written because it uses a bit of deus ex machina. What that means is, you know, there's a big problem, no one knows how to solve it, and then essentially God or the narrator reaches in and just provides the characters, the protagonists, with a solution. Ta-da, it's fixed. Such as in the end of this film, when Grindelwald has this, you know, 
blood pact that he's made with Dumbledore, which is different from an unbreakable vow somehow. We're not really explained what's going on there, but it's different. There's a physical embodiment and he has it on his person at all times. And Newt didn't strategically do this. It just happened to happen. The Niffler escaped from his suitcase, scooted on by, and then just took it from Grindelwald, who didn't even notice. And it was like, if only he'd paid attention to the beasts. You didn't even know! You weren't paying attention to the beasts, Snoot! He just got out of your case! Goodbye, phone! That's how I felt in the theater. I wanted to leave. It's just this big, important thing that supposedly he's carrying with him at all times. Just coincidentally, luckily, the Niffler just escapes and gets it. There was no plan, it just happened, and then it's like, oh man, we'll find a way to... Stop this, stop this franchise, please. Another big important thing to note is there's another three films left in this franchise and the film is taking place in the 20s. Okay, Grindelwald gets stopped in 1945. I don't know how they're going to portray that many years, but it's probably going to feel like many, many years judging from how the editing has been. I'm not looking forward to that. Rowling has a habit of writing characters the way she wants them to and then retroactively changing things and retconning things just so it fits her PC narrative. So she could have made Dumbledore gay in the books if she really wanted to, but instead she wanted to have her cake and eat it too. She made him just completely boring and then went, by the way, he's gay afterwards, please buy the book now if you haven't bought it already because he's a representation. What are you doing? She's done that so many times with this one and it's just, Bad. I mean, yes, we know Dumbledore is gay now. She's established that. So this is the good chance for her to, you know, actually go through with that. Instead, we get a a line that I did like. It was a bit subtle, but I liked it when they were like, you and Grindelwald were, were like brothers. We were closer than brothers. All right, I'll take that. I wanted a bit more. However, there was such a missed opportunity in writing for the character of Dumbledore when you find out, oh, he's not fighting Grindelwald because they made some weird blood oath thing. That's it? That's why? That's such a boring reason not to. It could have been this really big internal struggle, you know, as a character when you're like, oh man, Dumbledore can't do it because he has feelings for Grindelwald still and he can't hurt this man that he used to love. And you're like, oh, such a good inner battle going on in Dumbledore's head. He really wants to help, but he can't. That's good writing. What's bad writing is, uh, yeah, we just made a promise we can't battle each other. What does that prove? Nothing. Oh my God, just, why? Just as a note, a funny thing I found out recently is that in US cinemas such as Regal and Cinemark, they actually had an ad playing before the film that said, don't be a Hufflepuff, turn your phones off. <laughs> Which is really funny, like objectively, but as you can imagine, <laughs> Hufflepuffs got very triggered by this. They were so angry. This is bad marketing. Do they even know that Newt Scamander is a Hufflepuff? I just want you to know, it's not real, you squib. Calm down. <laughs> it's just... Uh, but I guess that shows how bad the marketing is around this film only because like Hufflepuff's the only people that are probably kind enough to say anything positive about this film in the first place. So maybe don't attack them. <laughs> One of the biggest flaws this film had was that there was just a plethora of just forgettable extra characters that just kept coming in out of nowhere and you as an audience didn't really care enough about any of them for them to have any motivations at all. It just didn't really make sense. And I'm not even talking about the beasts here. By the way, I think the beasts, we're just gonna be positive here. The beasts were a lot better in this film than the original, okay? Fantastic Beasts, there was thousands of beasts. They were all doing different things. I didn't care about any of them. In this one, there was like two or three important beasts. They had roles. They were more developed than the actual characters on screen. Good job. So first off, we have Theseus. The brother of Newt Scamander is into his ex, uh, works as an R, doesn't really have much of a motivation to this whole film, don't really know. His ex, she's important. She's a Lestrange who now is part of like, an extra family thing where like, she has a secret brother who has a secret brother and she switched babies, possibly on the Titanic, with a Dumbledore. There's way too much going on with these characters that we just met, don't really know anything about, and don't care about. Also, let's just talk about Queenie, okay? Queenie as a character was established in the first film, so we already know a bit about her. I didn't really like her in the first film. I felt like it was like, oh, I'm a hot woman and this is a fat dude. We're gonna get together just like all Hollywood tropes. I didn't really like that as much, but here we have her back in this film. Maybe she can establish herself as more of a female like role model that doesn't necessarily just need to be there to pleasure a man, even though every female in this film seems to be centered around that purpose. Either way, so no, we're introduced to her in this film when she's with Jacob, who she's put a charm on. And by the way, Jacob's memories that were just, you know, all erased at the end of the first film, pfft, nah, we'll just, that didn't happen, guys. JK literally just took an eraser and went, nah, it just didn't work. 
It only got rid of the bad memories. These were all good memories. LOL saved the day. Also, Johnny Depp, he's just gonna escape. Thanks, Grindelwald. Just gone. Everything that happened in the first film doesn't matter. We'll just start over. It's me, J.K. Rowling. This is how I write now. But anyway, back to Queenie. So she puts this charm on Jacob so that he's in love with her. They're gonna get married. Newt removes it. And then he's like, oh wait, you wanted to get married to me? And Queenie's like, you don't want to get married? He's like, you had me under a charm. She's like, I'm so sad. And he's like, I'm sorry? Wait. What, what do you mean? I, I mean, I still like you. Then she just cries and leaves. And it's kind of very confusing. And you're like, why did she leave? She kind of did this to him. I'm very confused with her motivation as a character. Maybe this is established more in the future. It's not. She then goes to Paris. She thinks she hears Jacob's voice. She does. But she left him, right? She willingly left him. She goes to Paris. She hears his voice. And then we have a four minute cutscene of her screaming and crying his name. Jacob! Jacob! And it's just crying in Paris. What? That is not what any normal human would do. What the heck is wrong with this character? That's not normal. Four minutes of scene, just crying and screaming in Paris because you think you heard someone's voice? You, what? what? What is, and then it's literally just her screaming until she's picked up by Grindelwald, who's like, you know, uh, you're great, Queenie. You, you could do great things. I don't even know what happened to that scene. Honestly, it was so hard to follow. And then it gets to the end. She's back with Jacob. She's like, oh, I love you, but let's listen to this guy that thinks we should kill all of the people like you and also hates, you know, horrors like my sister. But it's just, there's no reasoning for her character to be the way she is unless she's under some type of spell, but it's just lazy writing. Why? There's so many better ways they could have done J.K. Rowling has this stupendous ability to write backstories for characters that nobody ever wanted. Like, it really wouldn't surprise me if in the third Fantastic Beasts film, it turns out that Hedwig was actually the owl of Winston Churchill's back in the day, also was never a white owl, has always been a black owl, and if you didn't see that, you're just dumb, and maybe Cho Chang's dad was secretly a transformer named Bumblebee. And you really can't say anything about it. She's the author, this is all canon now, so you just gotta deal with it. What am I talking about? Nagini. What freaking purpose did that character serve? Nagini is a snake. We know that Voldemort has no love, has no friends. His closest friend is a snake, all right? That says a lot about that character. What you can do with this Harry Potter book, you can open it, if you're JK Rowling, and just put human excrement in it and then squish it back and just ruin everything you've made. Now Nagini is a human that turns into snake and can't unturn into a snake? Who wanted this? Nobody wanted this. Nobody thought that was a good idea. Who? Someone just take the pencil away from Rowling because she she's gonna eventually make it. That Harry Potter's secretly like an 80 year old pedophile. I don't know, she could write it and you'd have to believe it because it's canon now. Nagini as a character in this film serves zero purpose. I can count the number of words she said in this film on two hands. Honestly, she just stood by Credence's side for like four different scenes and that's it. She didn't say much. She literally was in the circus with him and was like, I turned into a snake. Secondly, she then stood by him when she, he was looking for his family and she was like, is that your family? Three, she stood by him in the Grindelwald like area. There is no purpose for her. She literally was useless as a character as most all characters in this film were, her most specifically. There's no reason for this character to exist outside of rolling yet again, trying to dip into the nostalgia pool of things she's already written and try and make people excited for the film when in reality, she's just ruining it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we all know JK loves a good throwback. A lot of this film was constantly trying to throw back to different things that you've already loved about Harry Potter. So that way you might think, man, it was really worth spending 12 pounds on this filler or movie. One of the good instances of that is, what's your name? I'm Nicholas Flamel. And you as an audience member are like, oh my gosh, Nicholas Flamel, that's really cool. I think that's completely fine. I think that was actually really well done. Until he went to get something out of his cabinet and he opens the door and it's just like, ah, oh, don't mind that. <laughs> you might have noticed the sorcerer's stone. I just keep it right up there. Let me just close that. Anyone notice? Anyone notice that's the first book actually? Philosopher, if you're from Britain. Why? Literally, if I had to review this in one word, this whole film, it would just be why. Why? That just, uh. Now here's an honest question for all of you, all right? Security is a really important thing in the world. I assume so as well in the wizarding world. How is it that Polyjuice Potion just gets around everyone? You'd think that maybe Azkaban, the most intensive prison in the wizarding world, might have something against Polyjuice Potion. No! Also, Polyjuice Potion, maybe they'd have a detector for that? In the Ministry of Magic? Nah! Just drink a potion, come on in. We'll let anyone in. Terrorists, anyone, just come on in. And even worse than that, you don't even need a Polyjuice potion to get into the Ministry of Magic. In fact, when Newt and his friend, who yet again, I can't remember the name because they're just forgettable, goes in there, lies about who they are, right? They get into the incredibly important records area of the Ministry. The receptionist lets them by. She lets them into that incredibly important building. And then a really funny shot, the camera pans up and you just see her face going, 
hmm, suspicious look, and the music's like, dun -dun -dun -dun. and I'm like, what? Is she an important character? No, she just lets them spend 10 minutes in the important records area finding stuff, and then, after they've finished their antics, she then goes, ha ha, I knew you weren't supposed to be in here, I'm going to sick my cat beasts on you. What? Who hired her as a security guard? Are you just gonna let people in and do their stuff and then attack them? Don't let them in! You knew! You had this suspicious face and you're going to let them in- It- Who wrote this? Rowling. Rowling wrote this. She cannot write anymore. Take away her pen! Now I understand Grindelwald is actually an incredibly strong wizard, alright? I know that. He's supposed to be one of the strongest out there. Him and Dumbledore are very, very strong. Now, how much stronger than everyone else it seems an unbelievable amount. How does one even get to the level that Grindelwald is, all right? If everyone's been practicing wizardry their whole lives, and yet Grindelwald somehow is able to summon a CGI dragon that can destroy the entire city of Paris just with a flick of his wand, like, oops, might destroy the entire city of Paris, despite me telling my followers, like, watch out for this war with atomic bombs. Meanwhile, Bye, Paris, just a flick of my wand and then boom, that's how strong I am. It seems unbelievably OP in this universe that someone is that strong. Sure, you can be a lot stronger than other people, but that's just unbelievable. Maybe it's just for the fact that Rowling really, really wanted us to enjoy watching a five minute scene where a CGI dragon just flies around a graveyard while lots of people with CGI orange dragons fight against it by shoving their wands in the ground. Who needed that scene? Honestly, even if you like this film, let's be honest with each other here. What was the purpose of that scene? To show off CGI. There was no storytelling elements of that. It was five minutes of a freaking blue CGI dragon going in a circle going, I'm gonna break out of this. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm gonna break out. Nope. Why? Why? I'm sorry, I sound a bit angry. It's just... There was so many bad things about this film, it's really hard to be happy about. All right, so here's where I get into the very small, funny nitpicks. We've established throughout the Harry Potter universe that cleaning is actually quite simple. Flick of your wrist, boom, clean o memorino. All right, Molly Weasley cleans the whole house, bam, it's done. At the end of the first Fantastic Beasts film, when the entire city of Manhattan is destroyed, no, oh, let's just fix it like this. Bibbidi bobbidi boo. Everyone just walks around the city with their wands and the, the literal skyscrapers just fix themselves, okay? So if we're living in a world where it's that easy to fix skyscrapers, boom, ba boom, bam, how is it that in the Ministry of Magic, they need to invent an eight brush steampunk vacuum to clean their hallways? This is a weird nitpick. I saw that and just started laughing because I'm like, what purpose does this weird muggle machine serve when you can just go clean, done? No, let's just invent an eight brush vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> they can't both exist in the same universe. Like, there's no purpose for this vacuum in a world where I can just go clean. Like, come on. I like the little nod that Rowling gave to herself. When people were complaining in the first film that they called them nomadges, and everyone was like, that's such a dumb name. And she was like, oh, it's different in America. And so in this film, she just doubled down on that and had Grindelwald do a speech and be like, the can't spells. <laughs> Imagine being called a can't spell. Like, you're just a can't spell. And it's like, listen here, sir, I want to spell and be in fifth grade. I can spell just fine good, can I? Yeah, <laughs> come on. So what were my thoughts on the film? You might be wandering. We're going to reuse the pun. Well, I wish someone on the other side of the screen had just avada cadavered me before I watched it. Would have saved me a lot less hassle. But here's the thing. You can like something. You can like a universe. You can like an idea and still dislike the delivery of it. All right. I love Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is one of my favorite things in the world. I've read the books multiple times. I've read The Hobbit like at least six times. I've read like The Children of Hurin, Unfinished Tales 1 and 2, The Silmarillion, all the backstory stuff. I love that. However, when The Hobbit films came out, you didn't see me going, these films are great. I'm lying to myself. They're terrible, okay? We can be honest with each other. The Hobbit films are very, very bad. They did a really bad job with them, especially when you consider that Lord of the Rings was so well received. They spent so long on those, they were perfect. The Hobbit was bad. I'm not going to lie to myself and my followers just to protect my image that I love Lord of the Rings. Nah, I can love Lord of the Rings and say that those were really badly done. Let's just say you really love chocolate ice cream. Everyone knows you love chocolate ice cream. You come into my ice cream parlor, you ask for some chocolate ice cream. I literally crap in my hand, put it in a cone, and give it to you. You eat it and you go, man, I just mm, love chocolate ice cream. You just ate shit, okay? I just fed you some shit and you're still lying to yourself and saying it's good. It's okay to say this wasn't the best chocolate ice cream I've ever had. Tasted a bit like shit. You can say that, it's fine. It doesn't mean that the other chocolate ice creams you've had have been bad. 
What a weird analogy. Harry Potter was well done. It's okay to admit that the Fantastic Beasts films are a disaster. It's okay. You don't have to lie to yourself anymore. It's fine. There are things you can enjoy about these films. Sure, the acting, maybe. Being able to slightly relive the nostalgia of being in the Harry Potter universe, but they're ruining it. They're driving it into the ground for an obvious cash grab because Rowling needs more cash. And it's a bit depressing. Coming from a Potterhead, it's very sad. Those are just my thoughts. If you agree, tell me below. If you disagree, tell me. What were your thoughts on the new film, on the new whole thing? We're not going to Curse of Child, by the way. I've already made a whole film about that. You can watch that here if you want. That was bad. <laughs> right. I don't think anyone I've ever met has said Curse of Child was good. But anyway, thanks for watching. Tell me your thoughts below. You can subscribe because I make new videos every Sunday. We'll get through this together. Excited for the third film, The Crimes of Grindelwald Part 2. There weren't any crimes! Where were the crimes?